when when people are angry and they have a legitimate right to be angry across the country, they become susceptible to a nostalgia of a life that's gone and they knew as opposed to a future that remains unknowable, unseen, and is being described by a class of people that generally speaking, none of them have any trust on, right? That are that are completely removed. So, you know, for example, when you when you think about this moment in politics, I was watching CNN one afternoon, and about 80% of the people that were on appeared on the screen were from Washington, DC. Okay. which represents 0.02% of the American population. And so the ratings of all of these shows are declining. And a lot of the analysis is, well, people are tuning out of politics, except for the fact that the turnout is increasing in each successive election. So maybe it's not that they're disinterested in politics, because the numbers would suggest the American people have never been more engaged, it's that they're turning off the crappy content and the two things don't have anything to do with one another, is that there's an epic staleness in, in American politics and that there's not been an effective messenger uh, that has picked up, captured the national imagination, right, in, in the context of a new era right in american life and so you know, we've we've had um you know two two categories of presidents in the 20th century uh that were born in the 20th century um lyndon johnson was born in 1908 jimmy carter and george herbert walker bush were born in 1924 uh this was the generation that was in uniform during the second world war uh, Jimmy Carter was an Annapolis cadet. He graduated in 1946. You know, but this generation held the White House from 1960 to 1992. Um, and then you've had a generation, uh, beginning with Bill Clinton, uh, of baby boomers that have held power in the White House from 1992 uh, through 2024. And there's going to be a moment of generational change in the country. And, and what you hope to see is a dynamism, enthusiasm, uh, not to go and do message testing and polling and come up with trite sound bites and all manner of banal, banal expressions, but, but instead, right, to have an animating vision about where the country should go, how to take it there, that can be inclusive, invite people to come in and roots them to economic interest. At the end of the day, the purpose of politics is, is, is the peace, prosperity, and domestic tranquility business. Right? What partly was broken about the American media is what, why is Marjorie Taylor Greene so famous? I mean, there's a lot of Republican congressmen up there. Why, why do you know who she is? You know who she is for the same reason that people slow down to take a look at the accident, because of the spectacle, because of the incentives, because the person who's up there who's an expert in nuclear arms proliferation doesn't get onto cable news. Mm -hmm. The crazy people do. And, and so we, we have in our politics a... a a synergy of, of highly dysfunctional people that, that have come together, that are exerting power. A lot of it, though, is a chimera. Right? It's not real. It's entertainment that a couple million people are watching. We're not hostages to it, but there needs to be a political leader who steps forward with conviction who will break free of it. And, and, and that's someone who's younger, who has idealism, enough pragmatism, and can articulate a reform message because we need deep reform across wide swaths of American life. We have always had uh, people who practice journalism, who didn't have a big degree and didn't have a lot of background and, and you know, 
you look at the weekly newspaper editor, uh, you know, I, I, when I was a little kid, I was 11 years old and I rode down the main street of my small town uh, on my bicycle and I went to the weekly newspaper office. And I said to Carl Kruger, who was the editor, publisher, reporter, photographer, printer, ad salesman, and everything else at this, it was a one man shop in, in this little town. I said, I, I'm, you know, I read the constitution, I read the bill of rights, I'm, I'm reporting for duty. I wanna be a journalist. And, and he said, well, great. I'll give you $5 for every story and a dollar for every picture that turns out. And I rode off on my bike and that night I covered the school board meeting, right? So it's important to understand that journalism is not, you know, it's not a group of high priests, right? It's not a, a group of people who, you know, always are, are, you know, the perfectly trained, most knowledgeable or something like that. But what's fallen apart in America, to my view, is this notion that there is at least some, you know, kind of there there for what journalism and communication should be. There's some basic set of concepts. And one of them is that um, you do try to be grounded in facts. And in reality, you can have a perspective, you can have a point of view, but, but there ought to be some grounding in reality. And, and that has just been blown apart. And what blows it apart is not necessarily that the people who are practicing, you know, whatever this is, uh, are always disreputable people. They're desperate. They want ratings. They want clicks. They want to be paid attention to. And so they will go, just as in politics, they will go to more extreme places. And again, this is this de-linked information, right? It is the best way, if you're in social media, the best way to get a big following, right, is to talk about the thing that everybody else is talking about, right? The biggest issue and just say something more extreme about it. The best way to lose a following, right, to end up nowhere, is to talk about something that is perhaps very, very important, but doesn't lend itself to clicks and ratings, right, that, that actually has a depth to it. What we're doing here, just think about the time we're spending here. Uh, we're gonna spend a couple hours, we are involved in spending the better part of a couple hours, uh, where we're talking and, uh, and we're going in deeper. It doesn't mean that Steve or I or, or either or you, Susie, or other folks here are going to get all the way to where we need to be, but we're giving it the time and the space. Most of our communications now doesn't do that. Most of our communications now is, you know, a number of characters on Twitter, uh, you know, a quick, you know, burst on cable. You know, when you're on cable, and Steve knows this, I do too. I've done, I haven't done as many cable shows as Steve, but um, I do a lot of them. And, and, you know, if, if it's a four minute segment, that's massive, right? That's, wow, I was on for four or five minutes. That's amazing. Uh, but, you know, you can't say it. You don't say much there. And so the whole system now is airing against depth and against seriousness, against any kind of, you know, uh, set of standards for it. And I know that we think that this is something that just happened, you know, like it's happening of, of the moment. Uh, but I will emphasize Right now, roughly this week or roughly in this period, we're 20 years on from the start of the war in Iraq, right? And you look at the communications leading up to the war in Iraq in this country. It was horrible. It was a disaster. We didn't have the debate we needed to have. We didn't have the range of opinions that we needed to have. And our traditional journalism did a lousy job, right? They, they did a lousy job. They lost a lot of trust. And the fact is, I don't think we've rebuilt that trust. So just as Steve says, we need a new generation of political figures who come forward and offer something, you know, that that really is what's next, what is and that and also not just what's next but that which is better. We need that in journalism too. We have to be having a deep deep discussion about how to how to recreate journalism in this new era. And we're not doing it. We're not we're not having it as seriously as we need to. And so as our journalism comes apart and becomes, you know, it, it just pulled in a thousand directions with very little sort of, you know, center of gravity and center of reality, our politics is being pulled apart as well, right? And as a society, uh, what we desperately need, and, and I know I saw somebody on the bottom said, well, you know, there's no savior coming or there's no, you know, the cavalry isn't coming or whatever. Uh, and and I think that that there does have to be you know, we do have to have leadership and we do have to have people who stand up. And you know what, the, when Steve talks about a political leader who might stand up a new kind of political leader, 
uh, I'll tell you what, what that political leader is going to be. It's going to be somebody who says, you know what? Not just, I'm just not going to do these cable shows. I'm, just, I'm not going to do it. I will. You want to sit down for an hour and talk about something serious? I'm glad to do it. But I'm not going to do this soundbite thing. And I'm not going to go on and answer the question of the moment about a balloon floating someplace or something like that. I'm going to come because I want to talk about real things that really matter. And I don't know if we can get that. I don't know if it'll work. But I will tell you that that's the breaking point. That's the point where somebody says, I don't, I don't want to just give you a different politics. I want to give you a different discourse in America. And I want to give you a discourse that actually takes you seriously.